a simple strut and tie example. We're just gonna dip our toe in the water here today, find one aspect of it, but if you're liking this content in particular, leave a comment down below so we can expand with further design examples. All right, let's get into it. The figure you see above is, um, in all instances, let's call it a pile cap. I think that's something that's pretty common for a design example like this. You have your piles below it. You see the one on each end. Typically for a pile cap, they'd probably be squished in a little bit because you need some edge distances uh, for pile cap uh, design. And then you have a column above with a reaction of 400 kips. P sub U, so that's indicating that this is an LRFD factored load. So we are in strength design, which makes sense. Strut and tie is a concrete element, and that falls under the uh, material code of the ACI, which you design everything in concrete under strength design. So we're all aligned there. We're tasked with determining the required area of steel in tie BC. If you're just starting out, what's a tie and what's a strut? Well, a strut is your compression element of your strut and tie model, and a tie is the tension element of your strut and tie model. So in this instance, we can see labeled up above tie BC, that is that horizontal dashed line. Uh, so under load, this beam in green here is going to, well, this pile cap, our deep beam is going to deform in some kind of way like that, which means with concrete, you're going to be experiencing some tensile stresses down on the bottom face of that deep beam. Well, first things first, can we even design as a deep beam? Why do we need to design as a deep beam? Well, there becomes a certain point under testing and analysis that they have determined if a concrete member gets deep enough, the design principles for just a normal concrete beam and determining flexural capacity, it becomes inaccurate. So as you get a very, very deep section, uh, different things start to unfold and the capacity of said member, uh, it becomes misaligned with that first type of flexural design. So through extensive testing, they've determined that this strut and tie model is something that much more accurately represents deep concrete beam members. This example I ran using the ACI 318.14. However, current code uses the now newest edition, the 318.19. So there are differences throughout that uh, updated provision. So if you are doing a design, make sure that you are following those updates. But for today's example, I just have this with the 318.14, so apologies. Specifically, we're gonna head to section 9.9, .9, which is the deep beams section. Now, it states that you can confirm whether you have a deep beam or do not have a deep beam, and then that pivots you um, with your design methodology. Well, they specified that there is an A provision and a B provision that you can meet either of these to determine if you can proceed as a deep beam analysis. Provision A states that your clear span needs to be less than or equal to four times the depth of your beam. Well, for simplicity's sake, let's just say that our clear span is just 18 feet. That needs to be less than or equal to four times the depth, depth of eight feet of our pile cap. Four times eight is 32 feet. So we are significantly less than that number. So we, uh, we satisfy that first option, stating that we can indeed proceed forward as a deep beam design. Option B is all about locating the distance from your reaction, uh, PU over to one of your, your piles, six feet. And that needs to be less than or equal to two times the depth of your member. So two times H is 16 feet. So we absolutely fall under both of those requirements. You don't need to satisfy both, just one or the other, um, but we're just gonna go through both of them here today. Now that we've confirmed we can proceed forward with the deep beam analysis, you're gonna get kicked over to chapter 23. This is the actual uh, chapter for the design of a strut and tie system. Now, simply put, you need to design three things in a strut and tie system. Your struts, your ties, and your nodal zones. Those three things are laid out in chapter 23 and all the applicable equations to design them. In addition to those design elements, you also need to check dimensional limits, reinforcement limits, and reinforcement detailing. Uh, things like spacing requirements, maximum minimums, cover requirements, uh, area steel max and mins, and everything in between like that. For today's example, I said we are just scratching the surface and keeping it basic. So we are just designing our tie in this instance. And then we'll get into checking a little bit of reinforcement limits as well. Well, step one, we need to find our reactions. So 
F sub B and F sub C. Uh, oops, I have it blocked off a little bit. F sub C, right? Mm, there. And then from there, we're going to do a little Sokoto and geometry to determine the forces within our struts and our ties. But mainly, we just want that force in the tie that then we can design for. Additionally, the 400 kip axial load is assumed to already have gone through all of its applicable load combinations, and that 400 kips is the resultant of our worst case scenario. So we won't be going over any load combos today, but that's always, as we know as engineers, one of the, uh, one of the steps in every process of designing something. F sub B is equal to 400 kips times six feet divided by 18 feet, which gets us 133.3 kips. Now, this is simply boiling down that figure that we have over there into a simple supported beam with a point load on it. And you need to end up getting your reaction at either end. That, if you don't know off the top of your head, you can head over to the ACI manual with the shear moment and deflection diagrams chapter or section uh, where they have those equations laid out for this particular uh, load scenario. And F sub C is equal to 266.6 kips. As just a double check, both of those should add up back to your original singular axial load of 400 kips, which they do, so you're good. I know rounding-wise, 0.3 and 0.6, we're, we're missing 0.1 kip, but that's just a rounding error. All right, I have an additional figure drawn, which basically is capturing this portion of our strut and tie assembly. And ultimately, we want to boil down and find our F sub X is what I'm denoting here. I know I changed kind of the, the variable name, but F sub X, uh, that's our tie BC force that we're looking for. Well, first, we're going to need L sub H. And I think there's a couple of ways that you can do this based on uh, your preferences. But this is just the way that I prefer to do it this time. L sub H is just, uh, it's a 90 degree triangle. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And that gets you a length of the hypotenuse of 14.15 feet. Then I plugged in to find what I'm calling F sub H, which is our hypotenuse force. That's simply 14.15 over 7.5. So that's using the lengths to magnify the force gets you 251.5 kips. So that F sub H ends up being your strut, uh, if I go highlighter here, AB uh, force that you then would design your strut AB for in compression. So that's a little side tangent here. But for us, now we need to find F sub X, same thing. That gets us 213.3 kips as our tie design force, so lovely there. Step three, we're determining our tie capacity now that we have the demand on the tie, um, and we're gonna design that per ACI 318.14, and we're gonna head to chapter 23.7. Now, you'll see an equation there for our tensile capacity, and that's FNT is equal to, it's kinda long, but no need to panic, because this, if I go blue, portion of the equation is only if you have PT design. Uh, today, we're just going to be using regular reinforcement. It's not a PT uh, pile cap. So ultimately, you're just going to scratch out that portion of the equation. And this leaves us with a pretty simple equation. Ultimately, it breaks down into just the area of steel required and the yield strength of the steel that you're specifying. Those two things together, uh, you know, uh, square inches of steel and KSI capacity of your steel material gets you kip capacity of uh, your tie. So pretty straightforward. And as we know, we are designing under LRFD, so we need a fee factor. And you might say we're doing flexure, so you need you need to determine if it's between 0 0.9 and you know point. Uh, what does it drop down to? Point. 6.5, depending if you're tensile controlled or compression controlled and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you actually do not do that here today because the fee that you're going to be applying, they have a specific value for strut and tie analysis. And that fee is 0 0.75. A little trick of the trade here, instead of like I used to do as a younger engineer, plugging in you know uh, a theoretical bar size and spacing 
using that area of steel and calculating a capacity and comparing that to the demand. Instead, what you can do, and, and then you know, going back and forth, do I have enough, do I have not enough, and, and doing an iterative process that way. Instead, you can do this. Let's plug in our T sub U into our capacity, and then we will back out the required area of steel that we need to meet that demand, and then you're done. For today, we're gonna to be using 60 KSI rebar, so nothing out of the ordinary there. We're not using high strength bar or anything like that. That dumps out an area of steel required of 3.55 square inches. But let's not forget about our fee. We need to take that in consideration. So we need to divide by fee in order to increase the amount of steel to account for that reduction factor. So divide by 0 0.75, that increases your answer to 4.8 square inches of rebar required for your tension tie. And then because we solved for that to back out exactly what was required for the demand, let's just bump that up a little bit and call that 5.0 square inches of steel required, okay? Lastly, let's check our AS minimum requirements. That you actually head back to chapter nine, head over to uh, section 9.9.3.2 where it states that AS min can be found per the requirements of section 9.6.1. So you remain in chapter nine, you go back a couple of pages, and actually it's just the normal AS uh, requirements for flexural steel in a normal concrete beam. So it looks a little something like this. And because I'm doing this check, I'm realizing that I left out a little critical information that we need. Uh, so on the fly, let me see if I can kind of string this together. Let's assume we have a two pile pile cap. And it looks like that. So this is a plan view over pile cap. So looking, looking down under the pile cap, that's our column that has our PU reaction on it. And we know that it's, you know, offset. So that's the six feet and that's the 12 feet. And then the dash are our piles below. Uh, let's give a width. Hmm, what do we want to give that a width of? Uh, let's say that that column is, is a two by two column. Uh, so we'll do a pile cap of I don't know, let's say, let's say five feet. I don't know if I'm meeting the, the proper dimensional requirements for pile cap design, but let's assume five feet is adequate. Also, we need our property compressive strength. We'll use 4,000 PSI, pretty standard, nothing too crazy. And we said that our bar stre uh, yield strength is 60,000 PSI. Again, real standard. Okay, that should be everything that we need. Let's check it out. Again, a little trick of the trade when you're comparing which one governs, you can leave out these because they're equ they're equal to one another and they're the same in both option A and option B. So you only need to compare the parts of the equation outside of those green boxes against one another. Whichever one is greater, you will use, and then you'll use the full equation. We can see that option B is our larger value, so we need to use that. And let's remember when you are solving for these, uh, you need to keep it in PSI because you are under the square root. So you can't do, you know, for KSI under the square root. That's a no-go for the ACI. If you're doing Ashto, you do get to do that, but that's another, that's a whole nother can of worms. So that's just a little reminder there. Our base width is going to be five feet. And we're going to convert that into inches. And then our depth, if we scroll back up here, is, and I didn't mention this before, but is seven and a half feet. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought our pile cap was eight feet thick. Well, we do have a cover, clear cover of six inches that was uh, denoted in the figure. You might not have seen it. I didn't mention it, but there it is. So if you're scratching your head beforehand going, what the heck is the six, seven and a half feet? That's eight feet minus six inches. So we're gonna use that seven and a half feet, 7.5 times 12 inches, again, because we're converting, and that's gonna dump out an AS min equal to 17.82 inches squared. So that AS min is significantly more steel than the area of steel that we calculated at five square inches. So we don't even come close to the AS min requirements. And that makes sense. When you think about it, we have a massive chunk of concrete. Eight feet thick is, is really, really thick. Uh, by five feet you know, into the page is just a massive hunk of concrete. So although we've calculated that our tie uh, 
demand only requires five square inches of steel for the flexural tensile steel at the base. Uh, there's other provisions in the ACI that must be met uh, in order to make sure you have an adequate design. So in today's example, we didn't even come close. We need to jack up the amount of steel that we need in there. Uh, I do know that there is an exception where it states that if AS is greater than 1.33 AS required, then the AS min check isn't required anymore. I don't know for any reasons uh, for pile cap or strut and tie analysis that that exception can't be used. I think that might have gotten kicked out of certain analysis in the updated ACI 318. So um, I don't want to necessarily use that uh, here today because I'm just not absolutely certain about it. Um, but let's let's stop here on that and say that our AS min isn't required. You need a lot more steel and you'll just need to move forward with that in the design. Maybe I did miss something. If I did, leave me comments down below, call me out, you know, what the hell did I do wrong? I wanna know if I was doing something wrong and correct it so that we can keep moving forward and doing designs appropriately. But that'll do it today for this design example. A little strut and tie, just dipping our toe into the water. You still got, you know, nodal zone design. You still got strut design. We did a little tie design. And then you have, you know, embedment requirements at the nodal zones and all that kind of stuff mixed in between if you're doing a full strut and tie element analysis. But as always, this is Rich with Team Kesteva. Very happy to be here and cranking out more design examples again. I'll catch you in the next one sometime soon. Peace.